Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very good, okay. So now we are gonna to talk tonight about the seven factors of enlightenment. And I just realized uh, Doc is, Doc uh, Major's not here. <laughs> and I, um, I don't know how to put the support pages from my computer onto WhatsApp. I, it's a mystery to me. So I had support pages for you, but I asked him and I thought he would be here, but I guess he's not. So what we're gonna do is we're going to um, take a look at these. They're, they're very important, but I want you to be able to see uh, the interconnection and figure out some, a couple things about these seven factors. Of course, we've probably talked about them before, um, but in, in studying the hindrances, we figure out it's a total mystery to me why people think they should do anything other than abandon the hindrances because the evidence is so unbelievably overwhelming in the texts that the key thing that the Buddha wants you to do with all of your, um, all of your uh, practice and uh, he wants you to do the key thing he wants you to do with the hindrances or any disturbances, distractions, anything that interrupts you is abandon them. Now, it, how many, I don't know how many of you, I can't see you, but I don't know how many of you listened to Bhante's talk on 143. If you listened to him give a talk on 143, it was just recently and um, Major made a note of it um, on the, uh, list for you to to um, see that he did that talk. It's a funny note because it says um, it says Honeyball uh, Sutta and then it says MN 143. Of course that's wrong. It's not the Honeyball Sutta. 143 is advice to Anathapindika. Anathapindika, okay? And um, so I when I saw that I immediately put up a support page for you all because it's very important. And that suit is very important to me because it ended up when I started giving that suit to then people came to me and said, my father's dying. My sister has leukemia. My friend just had an accident and is dying. And what can we do? And of course we had just read the suit can we do this? And so we wrote up a special page for that. And then after that, we gave a a sort of a weekend talk and we developed a set of four pages for medical personnel as well um, that I can share with you if you wanted uh, for the Anathapindika Sutta because it's really a wonderful thing to be able to teach someone that Sutta to, for you to, as a family member to record it for them and then to sit with them and listen to it and then allow them to sit and listen to it and memorize it if they'd like to and then have them practicing that before they go to sleep each night. It's a wonderful sutta. Because when you look at death and dying, what you're looking at basically is leaving. And when you're leaving, the question is how many, how many movers do you wanna have come with you? You know. So the question is when you're leaving, you actually want to be able to go very clean, very pure, very rested, and very, very clear in your mind. And so when we did the workshop, we said, what should we call it? And it was basically dying with grace and dignity. Draw a shape to create a clean snip. I have no idea what that means. I don't have any idea what that means. It just came up on the screen. Snip, snip. <laughs> I have no idea what it means. All right. Um, 
it's like they're trying to sell me something when I use my programs lately and I just can't figure it out. I didn't ask for anything. But then with computers nowadays, you don't ask for anything. You go out and you innocently buy an empty computer. And I remember when they made a big deal about how much easier it was going to be to buy computers. And when we saw the prices, we were shocked. You know, We thought not 900, not 1500, $300 for a computer. Nobody told us it was empty. <laughs> You know, and then you had to buy all your packages of programs, but it's, it's insanity, but it's pure capitalism. It is pure marketing and bottom line raise the dollar routine. I mean, I've been in sales. I've been working with companies all my life and I, I thought I had went away from this, you know, and then you come to the computer and you're Buddhist and you think you're very innocent and bang, it's all back again. Anyway, so if you did listen to that sutta, um, shortly after um, I was taught that sutta, I was in uh, Sri Lanka and had the opportunity to go to a supporter's house whose great aunt was 92 with leukemia. And she was, um, the family, it wasn't her, but the family was shipping her off to the hospital every um, four days to get refilled and sent back, essentially, um, to refill her blood system and bring her back home. And, and then they knew she was very close to death. And she didn't particularly want this, but the ambulance would come, load her up, take her over, da, 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 bring her back. And this went on for a month. And then uh, she said, please, I don't want to do this anymore. And um, the family said, okay. And then she was introduced to me and I was reading her the sutta. And she said, can we keep this sutta? And I said, what? And she said, well, just could you read it to me and I could listen to it. I'd like to listen to it. And so she listened to it. So when I send you the notes, um, the section on the training that Sariputta does with um, Anathapindika is in first person so that you can learn it as you're reading it. You can learn it. I will not cling to the body and my consciousness will not be dependent on the body. And you go through this whole thing. And if you study this, if you tear it apart in sections and look at it very closely, this is like, okay, it's time to just empty out and leave in complete peace. That's what this is. And it's very gentle, it's very, if the person knows the basics um, of letting go, and most Buddhists know the five aggregates and the six sense doors, which is most of the sutta, and they're mostly familiar with the four elements, and look at it carefully, it's not complex at all. And then another opportunity was, anyway, she took it and she listened to it on the recording, then she started to do it. They heard her doing it before she went to sleep. When she died, she had a smile on her face. Whether it was because of this or not, I don't know. But the point is to empty, to let go, to let go, to let go of what you're seeing and you're hearing, you're smelling, you're tasting, you're touching, and what your thoughts are and rolling and what you're just, it's time to empty. It's time to say, okay, this body is finished and it's going. My uncle was very much that way when he died. He was 95. He wasn't much left. I mean, he had shrunk probably close to a foot. You know, he was this little person waddling down the hall to take you to dinner at the nursing home with him. Um, it wasn't much really left, but he was completely there here. And that's the interesting part of the stimulation of the mind. Can you be present? You were present when you were born. You're present when you're living, why not be present when you leave? You come that way and you open your eyes and wow, what are these lights or who's here? <laughs> and then you're growing up and you're existing, but why not reverse and say sun's teeth, sun's hair, sun's this, sun's everything from Shakespeare, why not do it that way? And she was very quiet, very peaceful. And then later on uh, in Malaysia, someone knew I did that from that family. And they said, would you go to the hospital and give it to her? And I thought to the hospital, mm, okay, fine. 
So we went to the hospital, she handed me the phone and said, would you record it? And we recorded it for her and the same sort of thing happened in a ward with other people around her very quietly and people in the ward, they listened to it. And it's a very um, uninterrupting kind of sutta. It's not, it's not offensive to anyone. It simply is what it is. And I talked to her a little bit about it and then um, gave it to her and that's what happened. And I used to like to go to the hospital, but it's not easy to do right now anymore. So um, I did send this, I don't know if I can send it to any of you and it would get on there for you, but um, let's dive into this with the seven, with the seven, uh, the seven factors of enlightenment and first go to the screen because you don't have the page. So I have to do it this way now. Okay, so basically the what you usually see when, when we are um, talking about the factors and for those who haven't been around us before, uh-oh, let's see what happened now. Okay, stop share there, let's start again. Stop share. There is the ask for share. Okay. If you haven't been around us when we're teaching, what in the world are we doing when we're teaching you, Twim? I was listening to people talking in a couple of talks last night, and I think it's good to make sure that you understand what we're doing when we're teaching you, Twim. The Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation is a method of meditation that's yoking together samatha and vipassana evenly evenly yoking it together into one practice with two components serenity and insight that's what it is and um when we are teaching you this practice we're attempting to go back to the early Buddhist texts, we say EBTs to the EBTs, and those are basically the four Nikayas, okay? And we go back to the Majjhima Nikaya and we work that very fully because in that book, the whole entire teaching is sourced. So we use that very strongly. And the Samyutta Nikaya agrees with it completely and supports it with smaller pieces, smaller sections. And when we're teaching you this practice, we're asking you to experiment. We're not recruiting you. This is not a cult. We don't really look for members or try to build membership. What we're trying to do is say, uh, allow us to show you this technique that the Buddha was using. And it was a lighter technique of meditation, a more comfortable type of meditation, a very portable, type of meditation that you would be able to take into your life. Now, when we're teaching you everything that we're reading to you, everything we are teaching you from the sutras, we are attempting uh, to show you how it's about the operation of the meditation. If we, we start by saying to you, who was the Buddha? Well, he, not his whole family history thing, but who was he when he was teaching? He was the greatest meditation teacher in the world. We, that's the way we look at him. So if he was this great meditation teacher in the world and he decided to teach for 45 years, the next question is, what did he teach? He knew he, he was going to teach people how to do what he did so they could see the same way he saw how everything actually works. That's what he's attempting to do when he's teaching us. That's what we're attempting to help you do, to figure it out for yourself, to see it, okay? We're not allowed to teach if we're trained directly by Bonte. We're not allowed to teach unless we've experienced what we're teaching. So that makes it a little tricky because for instance, I didn't start for, um, I, I was slow, but I didn't start for nine years. I got stuff right away, but I was digging, digging, studying and writing and still asking tons of questions to tie things together. And uh, actually started teaching in 2009, but in 2002, I really, 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 really woke up. 
Okay, so that's what happened. And I was cautioned by a couple monks in the very beginning before I started practicing with Bonte, don't ever teach what you don't really completely understand and you've experienced and you understand. That's what they, they told me. And I thought, okay, fine, that I didn't think it was a big deal, but you, you don't wanna teach it when you learn it until you can really get to a place where you can try to explain it. Everything that the Buddha put out there concerning the meditation, if it's true, let's do it this way. If it's true, he's a meditation teacher and he's teaching the same subject for 45 years, a couple things stand to reason. It reason you can reason out pretty well that he probably figured out the way in which to teach people so they would remember it the easiest way and be able to tie things together. And when you search again and read the book the second, third, fourth time, and you start reading it and, and you see how it's all tied together with the suttas that are particularly about the meditation, then you begin to see how he was working with this. It's really, really quite exciting. And it systematically doesn't agree with, uh, doesn't disagree with itself on anywhere that we can find. It's really quite amazing how he used deductive reasoning to show you how it works and tried to help you to understand how to do that too. Now these, so when, the, when we're, the conclusion I want to get to is when you read the suttas, you don't read them as we don't. We don't, we're told not to read them as isolated pieces uh, that are one story, another story, this story, that story, like that. We're, we read them to find what is in it that will help you concerning your meditation. And there's almost, there's always a lesson in there. And so why is there always a lesson in there? There is a lesson in there because his method of teaching is based on the Four Noble Truths. And if you start to examine the suttas as we're learning them, you'll find first noble truth in the beginning, then second, then third, then fourth, or one, two, and three, or one, two, and four. And you really begin to understand the Four Noble Truths when you do this, when you start to examine it very, very closely. Now, so far we've gone through and talked about the seven, the 37 requisites of enlightenment, which is a block of teaching that we see. It's a capsule that pops up in suttas here and there in different parts of the, the uh, Nikayas. And it just spelled, it's just a list, you know? And then you begin to, if you put that on a sheet of paper in front of you and build this sheet of paper, where we are now is to the seven factors of enlightenment. We started with the four foundations of mindfulness, um, four spiritual powers, then the, um, the four steps of right effort. And we explained right effort is right striving. And then we went to the five faculties, five powers. Now we're at the seven enlightenment factors. So what are these? They are a set of pieces and let's try to look at them to see if you can prove a couple things to yourself about these. But the first one, and I'm gonna show you the artwork first that, that we usually show people um, about this. And it's like, there's a seesaw like this. I'm not doing a very good one at all. Let's do this again. I know better than this. Just a second. And then what you see is you see a, um, a seesaw that goes across like this. a little better and I like this I like to do it like this this is where mindfulness is so this one is mindfulness and then you have the seesaw which is not quite the angle I want it to be but it'll do and you divide your seesaw into three parts there and three parts on the other side and what you find if you look at the seesaw is that you um
you, you, um, whoops. <laughs> Ow. Oh. On this side over here, you're going to see that there are energy pieces. On this side over here, you're gonna see that there are calmer pieces. So the first one, this takes energy, investigation. Energy, the control of your energy. Joy. And then down here, what always, when joy fades away, what always happens is tranquility arises. Oh, you can remember that little point. That's true through the whole system. Tranquility. Concentration. Or collectedness, we'll say collectedness. and equanimity. Okay. Now, the, the most interesting part about these seven pieces is that you, when you're working with the meditation and you're working with the path, you cannot go into cessation unless your seven enlightenment factors are absolutely level like this. They're level on this, like that. And then it's like, there's a secret key. This is a key and here's a keyhole like that. Okay. And you're gonna put this in and you're gonna turn it and you fall over into cessation. It's my visualization of it is just an idea. And the thing about this is, this doesn't, isn't something you can say, okay, I'm here, I'm gonna do this because by the time you get to the level that we're talking about, in the level in the fourth jhana, and let's remember something about the fourth jhana. The fourth jhana is the fourth, which is the base of the fourth. And then it's infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. And then what happens is there's cessation, okay? So you're traveling down this path and this is what, this is, what is you're, you're going down. Now, only in modern times is this the fifth one, sixth one, seventh one, eighth one. And some people even write about it in modern literature and say, this is the ninth. They say that sort of thing, but the actual, and the actual situation is these are the arupa, whoops, arupa, arupa. And the arupa simply means immaterial jhanas, it means that they're all mental jhanas, it means that there is no body anymore involved in, you start these experiences, if you look closely, your body is disappearing and it's just disappearing so that you can't feel it at all. Now, this is not something cultish or uh, magical or um, physiologically impossible thing. <laughs> if I go to a doctor, I send my child to the doctor and say, if you want to understand, how do you feel your body? Ask your doctor. I had my kids ask the pediatrician. He was wonderful. He told them right away. He said, most of your body is made of water I think it's some 70 some odd percent of it is water, okay? And in order to hold your body together, it takes cohesion. This cohesion is the holding together of the body. In order for there to be cohesion, there has to be tension and there has to be tightness. And so you feel your body, you experience it in athletics, you run, you pump, you exercise, you feel your fingers, you feel everything completely. And the more stress and tension you have, the more you feel your body. When people have uh, depression, when they get to a point where they have a breakdown, if they do, 
it's a it's a um, sometimes a tremendous it's a, a tremendous letting go and collapsing like jello almost like there's just no feeling in the groups I worked with and the support groups that I helped and when I was doing advocacy it was like what in the world happened well one doctor said what happened was pretend that your body is a house and what happened was is you threw the breaker switch and everything turned off. And when that happened, there was almost, you felt like there was nothing left of you. You didn't hardly feel yourself at all for a while, sometimes more than a week or two, a person can be like that. But in this experience in the meditation, there's no danger of this because simply what's happening is when you're practicing twim, let's look at twim, when you're practicing twim, you, your steps in twim are to, is to recognize this tension and tightness. And then to, to basically, I'm going to do it this way, to let go, relax, smile, come back. This is, this is what it is. And as we showed you, when you relax and smile right here, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny little spot, tiny pinpoint that actually is cessation. And it's a, it's a glimpse, just a bare glimpse of no craving. This is the no craving. There's no craving here. And there's no clinging either. There's no craving though at all there. And if you keep doing this, this letting go, and then the relaxed step, you are lowering your tension and tightness in your body each time you practice like this. It's like you're on a little machine and you're just going like that. And eventually you reach zero tension and tightness and you fall into cessation. So twim or right effort, right striving is designed perfectly to support you to move down the path. And as you're going down, all of these are being developed and used. Now I'm gonna read you a sutta and the sutta I'm going to read from the Samyutta Nikaya, what I did for you and then I couldn't figure out how to send it to you. <laughs> you know, I think I sent this now to, uh, I, I wrote part of the sutta down, the one section of it, so that you would have a copy of it to go over yourself. And I wrote you one paragraph for each angle of this. I did two of the angles. I didn't do four of them. You're going to have to do the other four, or I can help you do it. I can write the other. If you ask me to, I can write the others. Um, the other two, but there's, I think there's four pieces in the sutta. There's one, two, three, and four. So let me give you this sutta is from the Samyutta Nikaya. And it is in the great book, the Mahavaga. It is in this tiny book, 46, number 46, the Bojanga Samyutta. And the sutta is number 51. So we, if we say SN, I'll show you this a minute. In the Semyutta Nikaya, how you find things is if you say SN, and then I say 46, I'm talking about the small book it's in. And then I'm giving you the sutta number like this. And I will give you, I would always give it to you the way it is right in the book. So it's 51 with a one like that. That's the sutta number. This is the book number. This is the volume, the Samyutta Nikaya. This tells you, 46 tells you it's Bojanga Samyutta. That's the internal book inside the book, big book itself, the collection. Okay, now this section is basically called, I'm gonna go out of here for a minute, we'll come back. <clears throat> this section that I'm reading you from has a lot of small, pieces that 
are wonderful. And if you if you can get the Samyutta and read the Bojanga Samyutta through a little bit at a time, it's very tiny ones in there that are really nice, you know? Um, here, let's do this one first. Let's do 48.8 for just real quick. This one says, students, this is the forerunner and precursor of the rising of the sun, that is the dawn. So too for a student, this is the forerunner and precursor of the arising of the seven factors of enlightenment, that is good friendship. When a student has a good friend, it is to be expected that he will develop and cultivate the seven factors of enlightenment. And they're talking about the Kaliyamita. So what is a Kaliyamita? The Kaliyamita is a good friend who is involved in this kind of exploration. So if Sunil had Bharat as a friend, they were Kaliyamitas in relationship to this practice. Perel can be my Kaliyamita or Perel and Sarah can be Kaliyamitas. You see, we can help each other, talk to each other because we're doing the same thing. And how does a student who has a good friend develop and cultivate the seven factors of enlightenment? Here, the student develops the enlightenment factor of mindfulness. He develops the enlightenment factor uh, of um, each one of these, right? <laughs> of in in, in um, investigation, he develops the factor of energy. He develops the factor of joy. He develops the factor of tranquility. He develops the, the factor of collectedness or productive concentration, productive level of comfortable concentration. And he develops the factor of equanimity to the strongest point he can. That's what he's developing. Now let's look at the discussions. We'll go back over here to 51. So that's what you're, you're doing while you're practicing. You're meeting and greeting these seven factors of enlightenment within other suttas, within other pieces of the training. You're meeting these things. Of course, you know what investigation is. It's the six uh, the six R's, the learning how to investigate and watch things and how to, how to handle them, okay? And of course, you understand what in the, in, uh, the mindfulness actually is the observation that you're using. You understand that, you understand it. And of course, you understand that you are paying attention to the energy involved because too much energy leads to restlessness and not enough energy leads to depre de depreciation or, or not enough energy to keep you going with your, your sittings, okay? And joy is a factor that uplifts mind and sharpens awareness. And that's why the smile is so important. That's why the smile is so important because it's what gives the uplift or opening lighter feeling in your mind and sharper awareness. So what? So, so you can catch the symptoms of the arising tension faster, which is tension and tightness arising in the practice. You don't even have to wait for a distraction to be pulling you all the way over there. But as you calm down and you lower with each time you practice your practice cycle, you're lowering your tension and tightness, then what happens is you're able to identify earlier and earlier the arising of a change in tension and tightness and know before it starts traveling over to the distraction here, you know, so you, you do your six R right there. And that's how right effort is turning into right striving because right striving is automatically happening back here. 
it's not happening on the way over there. But I try to explain to people who are beginners in the beginning, you're not going to let it go till it gets over here to the distraction. And then the next thing you know, you're, you're letting go of it as you see it or notice it's moving away, feel the pulling happening. And eventually you're over here. And most of you are over here with noticing something starting to arise and that's when you let it go and it's like never mind and the never mind if you say never mind is including the six steps just never mind and keep going and smiling you see so that's how that's working and then you uh also are balancing your collectedness level and your equanimity okay so He's basically saying he's going to teach you the nutriment and the denourishment in regard to the five hindrances or distractions and the seven factors of enlightenment. Listen carefully, students. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of the arisen sensual desire? There is, student, the sign of the beautiful. And when you frequently give careless attention to it, it is the nutriment for the arising of an arisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of that arisen sensual desire. And see, then it goes through each one of these. It says, what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen ill will student and for the increase and expansion of arisen ill will, there is the sign of the repulsive and gets you upset. Something you think is repulsive, you get upset with it. Frequently giving careless attention to that is the nutriment for the arising of an arisen ill will and for the increase and expansion of arisen ill will. And what, students, is the nutriment for the arising of an arisen sloth and torpor and for the increase and expansion of arisen sloth and torpor? There are students discontent lethargy lazy stretching drowsiness after meals sluggishness of the mind frequently giving careless attention to these is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen sloth and torpor and for the increase and expansion of arisen sloth and torpor and what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen restlessness and remorse. And for the increase and expansion of arisen restlessness, guilt and remorse, there is students unsettledness of mind, frequently giving careless attention to it is the nutriment for the arising of an arisen restlessness and remorse and for the increase and expansion of arisen restlessness and remorse. You dive into something, you feel miserable about what you did and you keep doing this all day long, you're feeding it. This is the careless attention. So do you see how this ties into, for instance, this one ties into the Vata Karata Sutta, which is the lesson of the past, the future and the present time. And now something happened that you feel you feel badly about and you start carrying this around because you feel bad about what you did, whether it was just an hour ago in a meeting or whether it was at home or whether it was being carried for a week long or something. You carry these things along, you're carrying the past in your pocket, you're sucking away today's energy and you're not using it properly. And what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen doubt and for the increase and expansion of arisen doubt? There are monks things that are the basis for doubt 
frequently giving careless attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen doubt and for the increase and expansion of arisen doubt. So there you are, okay? So you see how all of these are tied into Bada Karata Sutta, into past, into future, into present, when you look at it. Next one is the section two is the nutriments for the enlightenment factors. Now we're going to look at the nutriment for the enlightenment factors. We looked at the nutriment for the hindrances. Now we're going to look at the nutriment for the enlightenment factors. What is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness and for the fulfillment and development of arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness? That's your observation. There are things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of mindfulness. Frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness. And what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of discrimination or investigation of states and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of investigation of states. There are wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, inferior and superior states, dark and bright sides, of states and their counterparts. Frequently giving attention to these is the nourishment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of energy and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of energy. Well, there are the element of arousal, the element of endeavor, the element of exertion, and that has to do with the preparation for your meditation the actual endeavor of the meditation itself, and then your effort you put into your meditation for the arousal, the endeavor, and the exertion. Frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of energy and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of energy. Energy is dicey. It's dicey because if we go to 128, and we look at the different hindrances listed in 128, it goes beyond the five and it clues us in on some that are dangerous. And one of them is uh, basically too much energy, okay? And the other one, let's see, except, and here we go. You have excess of energy arose and you have deficiency of energy arose. Each one of those are serious disturbances and that's get you going rocky in your meditation. Doesn't matter if you're doing breathing, doesn't matter if you're doing metta, doesn't matter what kind of meditation you're doing, what we're teaching you right now is for the whole entire ball of wax. So that's how your energy works. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor of joy and for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of joy? Now they call this rapture. The reason we don't use that word is because of the Christian concept of rapture. And we don't wanna be talking about it and get confused. <laughs> Okay, it just means the internal joy and it has to do with mudita. It has to do with um, empathetic joy where you feel happiest when someone else is succeeding outside yourself. 
this is what it, this is really about. And they'll say, well, that's just joy. Well, it is joy, but it's a bit different because it's not about you. It isn't an I, me, my, mind joy. It is outside of that in more of an anatta world. Okay. Frequently giving careful attention to them as the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of joy and for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of joy. The one thing we keep hearing here is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor and the fulfillment by development of the arisen factors, two different stages of work with the seven factors of enlightenment, okay? And the enlightenment factor of uh, joy is not something to ever run away from. And this is confusing because some people think, oh, joy, stay away from that. Don't smile, don't, don't enjoy anything. But they're forgetting there's two sides of this whole thing in the development of the meditation. And that you start out in the, you're trying to get to the middle and work there before you get to the latter part later on and start letting go more of both sides. And so, so you're testing how extreme can the equanimity become? You see, you're testing that. And what is the nutriment for the arising of the tranquility for the fulfillment and development of the arise, arisen enlightenment factor of tranquility. There are tranquility of body, tranquility of mind, frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of tranquility and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of tranquility. And what is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of concentration and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of concentration or collectedness of mind? There are the sign of serenity, signs of serenity, the sign of non-dispersal, Frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of concentration and for the fulfillment by development of the arisen enlightenment factor of concentration or your, your collectedness of mind. It's just paying attention to getting to a productive level and productive level by definition we're saying means that if it's at a productive level, then everything's going to operate well and you're going to go smoothly to the path and start moving down the path deeper and deeper. When the Buddha was asked at one point by Ananda, what is good meditation? What is bad meditation in his opinion? All he had to say about it is if a meditation operates where it takes you to the path and you're able to move down towards the objective of Nibbana, it's good meditation. If it doesn't do that, it isn't. That's all he had to say about it. So he isn't being critical of anything else, really. He's just making a point. This is where I went. Nobody else ever went to this point. And this is how I did it. And he's being very specific. And when he speaks and tells things to the monks and explains it to them, it's always about how things are operating well or not. And what monks is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor of equanimity for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of equanimity. There are things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of equanimity. Frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of unarisen enlightenment factor of equanimity. And for the fulfillment and development of the arisen enlightenment factor of equanimity. And we go to the third section of this discussion. This is called the denourishment of the hindrances. Now he's going to tell you exactly how to get out of these hindrances, how to bring them into balance. 
what is the denourishment that prevents unarisen sensual desire from arising and arisen sensual desire from increasing and expanding? There is the sign of foulness, frequently giving careful attention to it is the denourishment that prevents unarisen sensual desire from arising and arisen sensual desire from increasing and expanding. Remember I told you that uh, the practice, uh, the cure for lust and over lustful, uh, you know, sometimes men will come and say, I'm so lustful, I can't have a relationship. Something has to happen. I have to solve this problem. But what can we show them? This is where the foulness practice comes to pull them back into balance. Because if they're in a position where they're this high with lust and everybody else is living here, this is not very good for the balance of things or for having a relationship, a family, and wanting everybody just away because I'm so lustful about this that no one can be here, we can't do anything else, this has to be the only thing. So we bring this down to this level and all it is is a training on uh, how to give up less and bring it back into balance. This is what this statement is actually about. The one thing I think that is extremely sad is when somebody takes the statement of studying, uh, practicing foulness to the extent where they hate everything, detest everything, don't wanna be around anybody and take it way, way, way to the extreme. And it's a very imbalanced practice when this was actually something that was supposed to bring us into balance. And this, this is another example of a slippage of not understanding that this practice was designed basically to bring a person into balance. Everything was balance and harmony and with nature. Everything was nature, balance, and harmony. We have to remember that's what he was about. Okay, there. that's the first one. And then what is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen ill will from arising and arisen ill will from increasing? and expanding. I think I have to go just a second, the water's coming. Hold on just a minute. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Yeah, so we don't want to get too into the extremes when we interpret things. This is taking us away from the balance. The thing I was going to say was uh, that is similar to the misunderstanding of Atta and Anatta and going to the extreme and thinking I have to give up my life and all my pronouns and give up everything about I, me, my, and mine completely, uttering completely. And I try to explain to people that you're talking the swing of a pendulum, you know, and if you see the swing of a pendulum and somebody is caught, they're caught on a nine in the clock, if you put, say this is the clock and they're caught on the nine in an extreme behavior pattern that you encourage them in the direction of the three. And in, a, in the case of a pendulum, if you can encourage it to the three, it's going to eventually end up at the six. And this is what we look at in nature. That's how this sort of thing works. So when they're talking to you about this, they're not talking to you about deprivation. He gave up deprivation. He gave up harming his body, causing pain, starving himself, all of that, he gave it up. And we will read that. I want to read that sutta next week. It hasn't been done in a long time. People need to listen to it. 
all the things that he tried that failed, many, all the extremes, a lot of them are listed in this sutta. And he keeps telling them at the end of each thing he describes, he keeps telling them, and this didn't lead to anything. It didn't free my mind. It didn't change my personality. It didn't make me kinder to people. It didn't help the world. Basically, this is what he's really describing, you know? And although it came into my mind, it didn't stay there. It did pass away. So he knew Anicca was real, but it didn't lead to any noble levels of accomplishment. He keeps telling them that. And then something changed. And we're going to read that next time. That one is 36. So we'll put that down for a reading next time. Um, Jimmy Nikai number 36, before we go in and work on the Eightfold Path the following week. Okay. So now, the next one here is what is the, um, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Here we go. What is the nourish, denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of investigation of states from arising and arisen enlightenment factor for the investigation of states from reaching fulfillment by development? There are bhikkhus wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, inferior and superior states, dark and bright states with their counterparts. Not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of investigation of states from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of, dis of investigation of states from reaching fulfillment by development. And what is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of energy from arising? The aris arisen enlightenment factor of energy from reaching its fulfillment and development there are the elements of arousal, the element of endeavor, the element of exertion, not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of energy from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of energy from reaching fulfillment by development. And what is the denourishment that prevents the arisen enlightenment factor of joy from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of joy from reaching fulfillment by development. There are things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of joy that not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the aris unarisen enlightenment factor of joy from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of joy from reaching fulfillment by development. And what is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of tranquility from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of tranquility from reaching fulfillment by development? There are tranquility of body, tranquility of mind not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of tranquility from rising and the arisen enlightenment factor of tranquility from reaching fulfillment by development. And what is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of collectedness of mind from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of concentration or collectedness of mind from reaching its fulfillment by development. There are the sign of serenity, the sign of non-dispersal, not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of collectedness from arising in the arisen enlightenment factor of collectedness 
from reaching fulfillment by development. And what is the, the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of equanimity from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of equanimity from reaching fulfillment by development? There are things that are the basis for the enlightenment factor of equanimity. Not frequently giving attention to them is the denourishment that prevents the unarisen enlightenment factor of equanimity from arising and the arisen enlightenment factor of equanimity from reaching fulfillment by development. So this is the seven factors. This is these seven pieces and the you couldn't have it more plainly that the whole system here is abandonment of the hindrances because it's telling you very precisely you have to abandon these hindrances in order for these to arise and we know we cannot go into cessation unless we have these seven pieces in perfect balance and then they fall just like falling over a waterfall into that last level now this tells us what they are and how to treat them or pay attention to them or not pay attention to them to abandon the um, what's making them grow into fulfillment and what's keeping them from growing into fulfillment but let's look at the framework now of how we actually learn about this when we are working with the meditation because it doesn't all start it doesn't all start just at the level of that discussion and this is what i really like people to learn i like them to understand that when you come in the door and here's the door and you come in <laughs> and once you come in the door you meet the meditation and how well i can remember how i met bunty the very first time in washington dc in washington buddhist temple washington buddhist vihara yeah and what did we do? We sat down. We all sat down. And here was a stage and here was a big Buddha. And here was a stage. And out comes body, Bonte, and he sits on the edge of the stage right here. And he faces us and he teaches us for 30 minutes. And this is his system, his actual system of teaching to teach you a 30 minute session of the, what you usually hear the first night of a retreat. So he's basically, actually, when he first comes out, he has you, he gives you the instructions. I'm sorry, I did this wrong. He gives you the instructions and asks you to sit. And there's no introduction beyond that. Okay, then what happens is he tells you about the five aggregates. He tells you the Four Noble Truths when he first starts talking, and then he says, here was the practice. You have five aggregates. You need to know about three kinds of feeling. And what's really interesting is from day one, he is teaching you dependent origination. You just don't know it. Because when he introduces you to feelings, three kinds of feelings, he demonstrates how a feeling happens 
and he shows you the six sense doors. And then he gives the example of the eye and the rose, the form, and the consciousness equaling contact. And then he says with contact as condition, he starts using the phrase precisely matching the suttas whenever he teaches and emphasizes that if you're gonna read the suttas to people, you need to start speaking with the exact same phrasing because everything you're doing is trying to teach them to learn it very, very well. And so when you start teaching, the best thing to do is from the beginning speaking with the I and form and consciousness, the meeting of the three is contact. We contact as condition leads to feeling, feelings arise. That's what he shows us. Then he says, with feeling as condition, he mentions craving, but just briefly, feeling, the feeling leads to craving. And he gets across to you right away in the beginning, craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and the body. It is the I like it, I don't like it mind. He tells it to you the first day. And then he takes questions from you. It's a very short little lesson. He tells you a little bit about how this works. You've heard it if you've been at a retreat. It's that little entry talk. It's not a long one that first night. We go away, we come back. The next time we, we, we systematically at that temple, we were sitting for half hour with him and then giving him all the time for talking. We weren't like sitting for an hour and then talking. We were sitting for half an hour together and then we were um, listening to him teach. And basically over the years establishing how he's doing things step by step. So you see how he did all this step by step. And then as we're training, this is how he introduces you. And then as you're training, what happens next is you begin to hear about the, you hear about these pieces. You do hear about, um, you know, um, when you go into the five faculties, you have uh, faith energy, you have faith energy, mindfulness. concentration, there it is, and wisdom, okay? So here are two of them right here, see, oops, right here. There's three of them right there. And you're learning these, you're learning them tucked inside the other pieces of the 37, you are learning these. You're also learning the importance of the use of them when we were talking about the basis of the spiritual powers you were learning how that was working in relationship to that, right? And it was including, this one shows up a lot. This one shows up a lot. And this one shows up all over the place, all right? And then the other one that shows up a lot in a lot of other places is equanimity. So these things are scattered in different approaches of learning them as you're, and you begin to learn, you know what you say to yourself one day, you know, this thing is not just all over the place. This is actually a weaving. It's a weaving. What he's doing is he's recreating what? He's recreating the Dhamma cloth. And in the old books, in the old books, uh, there's mention of a Dhamma cloth. And I love this because I used to do weaving and I used to sit at a weaving, you know, at a loom and for 36 inch uh, cloth, you can set it up for a little wider, but mostly 36 inch cloth and do weaving. And you can go in just to do so many times that you throw the shuttle and move the, the lines and then go out. And when I was teaching, uh, you know, activities at a nursing home, uh, the elderly people were rolled into a room at one of the places I worked where they had four looms and the exercise for a person, her activity was to come in and throw the shuttle six times and then be rolled back to her room. 
But that's all she could do. But she was proud as anything that she had something to do with making that piece of cloth. And then we had small ones that were making things the size of typewriters that were set up the same way as a regular loom. And you were making things the size of a placemat and they made them for Christmas and sold them for a Christmas, uh, you know, Christmas bazaar and got the money to keep their projects going at this little nursing home, this is a rest home and nursing home. You had ambulatory patients, you had patients that were in chairs. But you see, this was a Dama cloth and right here on the corner, right here is the Four Noble Truths. This is the Four Noble Truths, yeah, yeah. There's the four noble truths. And in this, you might have, you might have a, a, a color that comes out and shows up every so often. And it's the seven factors of enlightenment underneath inside, you see? So I'm trying to tell you, these things are not all over the place and you don't have to review all the different groups all the time. But the seven factors of enlightenment you actually, what's happening to them, what's happening to them is that you, mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, tranquility, collectedness, equanimity. These are the neighbors, they're moving into your neighborhood. And first you meet them, you might give them a cupcake or something, I don't know, give them a cake, give them something, you know, when they move in the neighborhood and say, hi, I don't know, that's in the country, that's what we do. We walk, I, when I moved into one cabin, these women came all the way, it was winter, you know, the snow was there and they hiked across the pasture with, uh, you know, their pies, <laughs> bringing their pies to me. This is just the meeting. So the first thing you do is you meet the neighbor, you meet the neighbor. And then maybe you get to have tea with them. You have tea with the neighbor. And then you get to know them and maybe you go to a picnic with them and you're, you're getting to know a little bit more about them. That's what happens with the development of these through the development of your practice of meditation. That's what I wanted to explain to you, okay? So I wanna throw this open for questions because by the time you get deeper in your practice and you're very quiet, I think some of you have had us tell you when you reach this, per, this one, nothingness. And if you are a person who gets really bored, you know, you want something to do, then what happens is we say, you know, you could take some time to see if you can balance these. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to questions now, okay? Yeah, so sister, I have a question about the nutriment for uh, the uh, uh, investigation factor or discrimination factor. You mentioned uh, from the sutta uh, several uh, mind states. I didn't understand those... Uh, different states which you which the sutta talks about dark and uh, bright what is dark and bright states happy and sad okay happy and sad dark thoughts. There are, yeah Depressive. i don't have the sutta with me but yeah. some other states also yeah. you mentioned yeah can okay, you just let's uh, see. tell me which one it was again the investigation uh, factor wait a second the nourishment or nutriment for the factor of investigation your uh, sn 4651 yep okay this is which part was it section section 1 uh, in, it's related to uh, factor of investigation for the arising of it yeah the arising of the factor of, of investigation, yes. fulfillment, and the um, of the original factor of the discrimination. Wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, inferior and superior states, dark and bright states, 
Yeah. What is yeah. the inferior and superior? The inferior and superior. But I always know this. I never can remember what it is. I have to um, That's Bunch, okay. Bunch, wait a minute. Don, Don, are you there? Do you remember what that is? I don't know if he's there. Okay. Um, the um, inferior and superior. Inferior, what I tend to say is that inferior is your states and superior is your um, arupa states. Okay. okay. It, nothing, nothing and it all, the, when you're talking about nutriment for the enlightenment factors, none of it is bothered. Okay. <laughs> You have careful, frequently giving careful attention to them is examining them with a balanced mind. There's no extreme in either direction, inferior, superior, bright, dark, disturbing. Okay. That's what you have to remember about this. When you're talking about just with these seven pieces, usually where you are is in the Arupa John, number one is where you're really, that's where you're really going to look at them. You're, you're always, they're always involved with your practice. If you, you put them on a piece of paper on a list, say from the beginning of practicing, is this involved with me being able to sit quietly and meditate? Yeah, all those pieces are involved in some way. You can't sort of eliminate them. Try it on a piece of paper, okay? Um, but when you go in, states where you can look at whether they are balanced. That's where we, we use the idea of we use the idea of okay in nothingness you're very quiet. You're just about to go quiet mind all the time in nothingness. But in the beginning of it you're you're here the first time and for a type A person miserable because they really want something to be going on and all of a sudden nothing is happening they don't know what to do and they keep jumping out to the teacher and explaining I just got to nothingness and i don't like it it's very funny you know and it's like you took away my candy Everyone always thinks to see and discover and he's like up in infinite consciousness and the expansion and contraction of infinite space and infinite consciousness all this is going on and then you tell the person now you're going to go into this and the person goes oh my god <laughs> you know and they're trying to be cool about it you know so what do we do with them sometimes if it, they're stressed out i can see you want something to do so be very quiet it very still. Imagine you are in um, in the Raiders of the Lost Ark or the cr Last Crusade. The, I think it's the Last Crusade, and you're inside the cave, and you came to where the crevice, the big crevice, is there, and there's no bridge, and you, there's only a wire from there to get to the other side, and you have to hold on to something. You hold on to the bar when you're walking on the high wire. You hold on to the bar for a reason to balance you, you see, so you don't fall in either direction. And we get them to play with the seven factors and they start balancing. Remember, I showed you the seesaw in the beginning. I showed you on one side is this energy. On the other side is this, is this calm and you're trying to get it like this so that you can walk across the wire to the other side. And if you can keep it level like this the whole way across the wire, you can fall into cessation. See, it's like a it's like a gymnast type thing <laughs> practice in your mind when you see it and people it really helps people sometimes to do this you know because these these are this side is energy and this side is less energy and you have your your you watch how you're not responsible for it you're not making it come up it's just arising in your mind but you have the power to tip you have volition means you can straighten it out now, what is happening to you uh, when you are 
people ask me this sometimes, what is happening to us that we haven't been restless at all and we get into this state and then all of a sudden we are doing this with the seven factors of enlightenment and we start to get restless again. What is happening? Well, before you started meditation, your brain didn't know about meditation. It didn't know you were allowed, it was allowed to let you meditate it didn't know that it was okay. It was watching precariously the human being to see if it's okay for them to do a meditation. But this is very gentle, non-disruptive, non-threatening, this, this meditation. There isn't any possibility of you having a nervous breakdown with this kind of meditation because it's all about nature and balancing and, and this way. There's nothing pushing in this meditation. I read some research on when they condemned meditation, this one place on the West Coast, but that was when everybody was doing concentration and heavy concentration was causing all the things that they were describing, causing tinnitus, causing vertigo, causing other types of problems. But this is very quiet. This is very, 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 very balanced, you know? And so your brain has to give you permission to do this. Just like if you did any of the forgiveness, people have initially when they start forgiveness, their brain kicks back if you've done it at all. And it kicks back because it wonders, is it okay for me to let Perel remember what happened when she was 10 years old? It's my responsibility to protect her from the shock she had when she fell out of that tree and somebody pushed her or something, you know? And, and you know now you're going to remember, is it really okay for me to let you do this? And the brain comes and it, it goes like this. It rocks everything. It's like an, a nervous line coming in like that. And you have to talk to your brain. A lot of this practice is about you understanding you can communicate with your brain. Listen to him. What you think and ponder on, that will become the inclination of your mind. You know, what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future, but you have a choice, only you. No one else can say do it or don't do it. Only you can decide. And this is where you're regaining the power of control in understanding you do have more control in your life than you thought you did. Yes? So I'm hoping that kind of answers the question. The inferior and superior, I have to go to another sutta to look that up because I know I have it, but I'll do it for you, okay? Okay, thank you, thank yeah. you. Anybody have another question? Assistant. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just ask a question? Um, so we've got some feedback here. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna swap over. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, following up that last question, are we saying then about this discrimination of states that we want to see the wholesome states and the unwholesome states, but we don't want uh, to get attached to either of them? Because it's the, the actual paragraph says here of course. Uh, that yeah. there are bhikkhus wholesome and unwholesome states. Yeah, that's and correct. it goes on to say, um, uh, frequently giving attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen enlightenment factor of discrimination of states. Right. So do we want to see both the wholesome and the unwholesome, or do we want to- you don't go find not them. This is, this is the important part for you. You don't go find them and look for them. Whatever comes yeah. up in your mind is just fine because you're in equanimity when you're working with these. Your equanimity is yeah. supporting you enough to be able to start to balance these, you see? Equanimity okay. is just formulating within the enlightenment factors, the enlightenment of the um, factors of enlightenment. Um, hmm, the factors of enlightenment are the level you need for the total balancing to fall into um, cessation. Okay, but all through your training, the the um, these things are floating around and your you're using them to some extent, you understand? And the thing you have to remember is you're working towards 
eventual imperturbability. That's the highest yep. level of equanimity. To understand what that is, is you have nothing to do with it at all. Nothing, yep. only observation. So as someone who wants to always be sure I make it right, do it right this way, that has to step out of the way and just leave the building and watch what happens inside the airplane hangar from outside on the driveway. You watch inside what's happening. Okay, so when, when it says then giving free, uh, frequently giving careful attention, what is that simply the, the, the observation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. say where it is again, um, which section? Uh, this is on page 1598, Nutriments of the Enlightenment Factors. Uh, Discrimination. Uh, second paragraph. Which one? Discrimination? Uh, they're all the same. Yes, discrimination. So frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment for the arising of the unarisen factor of discrimination of states. It just means that you're you're tuned in to investigation, how it works and how it doesn't upset you at all. Everything is neutral, totally impersonal. You're doing this with an anatta perspective, an imp totally impersonal perspective. There's no opinion involved at all. See, and you're just watching. This is the key to this thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and then what would be the counterpart of a wholesome state? Because it says uh, um, with their counter with their counterparts. So wholesome and wholesome with their counterparts. Where is what does it mean? Oh, sure. So if you if you have a dark state. Uh, come up dark and bright state well because it gave you a set of opposites here it did the count contra uh, the contra states you know wholesome unwholesome blameable blameless inferior superior dark and bright with their counterparts so when you watch one you consider the level of the other in yourself and you don't go uh, to the extreme do you understand this is having to do with the pendulum okay so you remember i said you were at nine and I wanted you to get to six to be balanced. That's where the psychologist yep. and the psychiatrist want us to get, okay? But the person goes to the three, okay, all the way over to the three, yeah? Okay, so yep. we want you to notice the, the, the three, but we don't want you to go all the way over there. We want you to be learning to sit at the six and watch the nine or this three if it comes up and you can look in either direction, nothing disturbs you. It's kind of, it's kind when you're looking at these in depth, it is you're at the place where you're getting ready to fall into over into cessation. And so you're looking for balance. And that's all this is about balance. Okay. Yep. And when, and when it was talking about collectedness, and it was discussing serenity, um, it, it also um, said, uh, <laughs> so sign of collectedness. How is serenity different to tranquility? How is serenity? Serenity? Now so this was in, in the enlightenment factor of concentration group here. Serenity has the component of tranquility in it. You understand? It's that kind of word. How do I attain serenity? I build tranquility. I build equanimity. You see, it's Tranquility is a component of serenity. Get it? Okay. So when it when it says here uh, the uh, arisen enlightenment fact of concentration, there are uh, because the where? sign of serenity, the sign of non dispersal. Where are you? Where are you? Uh, so where the, we're one, two, three, four paragraphs below what we were looking at for the investigation of states. On concentration. Yep. Well, not, okay, what does non-dispersal mean? The sign of non-dispersal. To disperse something is to disperse it and have it disappear, right? Non-dispersal. Non-dispersal, is that the collectiveness? So the sign of serenity, the sign of non-dispersal. Put yourself in a position where um, you don't just fall apart, yeah? But you're not like this, you're like this. That's the difference with our practice. You're not like this to be in non-dispersal position. 
you're in this position. You understand you're in this position. You understand you can observe things and figure things out. Yep. You see, that's the difference. I, I understand that. So the sign of serenity as part of concentration, is that um, a pointing towards uh, uh, tranquility or is that pointing towards equanimity? Once again, tranquility is within serenity. It's a component of it. Okay. You see? Get it? Okay, so, so so by attending to the sign of serenity, it's it, because they're the other side of the of the seesaw. Um, right. you, you've got um, uh, you, that, that's that's bringing that sense of balance in. You want to bring okay. You're in a deep state. I don't know where you're sitting. If you're sitting in quiet mind, we might say, and we say equanimity with tranquility or we wouldn't talk to you about serenity. You're practicing the practice of serenity, but you're talking about tranquility. That's why serenity is not one of the topics for the seven and factors of enlightenment. Get it? Okay. It's what you're trying to do is tell me that, <laughs> that's cute, but I don't think I wanna use that. <laughs> a duck without a stomach. You're trying to tell me that you talk to me about a duck without a stomach, but the duck has a stomach, but the stomach isn't different from the duck. It's inside the duck. Mm -hmm. You happy now? <laughs> Jeez. All right, you get it? It's okay. like parts. It's like parts. <laughs> that's a little bit further than I would have gone with it, but that's what I'm trying to get across. Serenity and insight is what you're practicing, but we don't take serenity and exchange, you know, fight with tranquility is a part of serenity. So is quiet mind. So is equanimity. So is balanced concentration and joy and discrimination and energy. Get it? Just right above where that concentration is in tranquility. Tranquility is one of the seven enlightenment factors. It's telling you it's a component we're discussing. These all seven of these for complete serenity and complete success with the serenity part of your meditation. Let's do it this way. You have to balance these seven enlightenment factors. Yep. See, does that make sense? Okay, yep. yeah. Forget yeah. about the duck and the stomach. <laughs> this is some bad sense of humor. Okay. okay that's, that's, uh, that's me done with my questions. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Umer, can I help you? Hello, Mataji. Hi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have. Uh gone back to Anapanasati because I feel it is much no, more refreshing no, for let me, me. Let me talk. Yeah, let me talk to you about that later, but or you can if you want. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just go ahead. Right. That is what I have been, uh, what I want to say that I've gone back to Anapanasati and I can sit easily for 30 minutes and I can have a, a relatively uh, good level of collectiveness and uh, I, there there's not much disturbance and towards the end of the session I have a problem because towards the end of the session the breath is let go of completely and everything becomes still, everything becomes calm, everything becomes uh, sort of collected. And the body and the mind is like, uh, the, the awareness which is projected outwards, like uh, you, even if your eyes is closed, you feel your awareness is projected outwards. It feels it is coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. The only thing you can feel is like the skin of your, of your face down to the, uh, bottom of your feet. Boomer, Boomer, can we stick with the sutta here? Can I talk to you afterwards a little bit? Because we're almost over the class. Can okay. I do that? Yes, but okay. if you can do it today, that would be good. I can. Just a second. Will you take this down, please? And I'll I'll go right after I close this. All right. The, okay. the room number, I have to give you the room number. It's 226. Write it down. 226. Say it back. 226. 226. 735. 7. 735. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, let's do it again. It's 226. 7, 7, 735. 735. 5759. Okay? Yes, I got it. 
All right, after this class, you can go there. And if you need a password, you can say one, two, three, four. All right, and I have to let you in. I have to set it up when I close this. I have to let you into that room when I set it up, okay? And I can yes, do, perfect. do a report then. Do you have any question about the sutta? Oh, no. Okay, fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, anybody else? Okay, are we happy with the seven factors of enlightenment is the question. Are we happy with the seven factors? I mean, I really like these guys because my, for my own self, what I did in nothingness was have a lot of fun with them because I could actually feel the bar holding onto the bar, crossing over the crevice, the, the great chasm inside the cave, getting to get to the other side. I could actually feel the bar. I couldn't feel anything else, but in I could I could feel this bar and the tipping, the tipping with too much energy, too much joy, too much investigation, too much curiosity. Back off, back off, step back, step back. Relax, relax, keep smiling, keep smiling and see what happens. But then you don't want to be pulled off into not being able to observe anything because you have too much tranquility and too much equanimity, too much, um, too much concentration. Too much concentration shuts us down, basically. Too much concentration starts to close our, our view, take away our peripheral view like this of the whole screen and make it so we have tunnel vision and that's all we can see. We don't want to do that because we don't know how what will arise in front of us from here, from here, from here, how it will happen. And we want to be able to see everything. Okay. So um, I have, I, I did include a paper. So there should be some stuff on Twim Asia. There should be a few things uh, that you can collect uh, in reference to uh, suit number 143. Um, I would like to do Sutta number 36 uh, next um, Wednesday, and then we can, uh, we can go into the Eightfold Path the following time, because I think it's important for you all to understand and listen to that Sutta and to listen to, to, to hear what it was he went through for us. I actually had a friend once who, you know, was very interested in the way of the cross in South America and the suffering that Jesus went through on the way of the cross. And at the end of the conversation at lunch, he said, you know, it's a shame no one suffered for you so much with Buddhism. And I thought to myself, she has no idea of the story. We didn't get into it. But, you know, the tremendous amount of suffering that the Buddha actually did in order to figure out how to go through just amazing to the level of emaciation where he could put his hand inside his stomach and feel his rib, his backbone. And we women can do that when we have a baby, by the way, we can do it right after having the baby, but that's the only time in our life we get to reach in our stomach and feel our backbone. <laughs> but it's not a pleasant thing. He was so emaciated and almost completely ready to die at that point when he finally turns around and says, all of this, none of it led to what I have discovered. And so this, uh, this Samadhi, this, uh, I was writing an article today for somebody and um, the word Samadhi is very interesting, the history of that word. And Rice Davies is the one, uh, he's the one that brings up, he wrote a dictionary. And if you look up the word Samadhi, in his dictionary, there is a subnote, and he will explain to you in the subnote that he takes that word to mean tranquil, uh, tranquility, and, and it means wisdom, tranquility, and wisdom. That's where our name of our practice comes from. He points out that samadhi as a word in Pali did not exist to mean concentration that there was already an active word in place for that, ekagata was the word. And then this word shows up 
after the time when he's enlightened. And Rice Davies has made the assumption that this word was the word he chose to separate himself from the concentration meditations that were going on. And I think it's a good theory. It's a good theory, probably something none of us can prove, but he came to this conclusion. And when we found that, we sort of looked and said, wow, that's exactly where we've gone with this. When we took Sama and D and said the serenity and the wisdom, the serenity and wisdom was there. And this, the, the insights occur for us. That was proved to us as students in Lesterville when Bonte came in one day at breakfast and asked us some questions about the insights that were attained in the Burmese tradition and we all knew the answers. How did we? How? You know? So this was real interesting back then. So I'll leave you now. And if we have a closing time now, a closing prayer, and I hope to see you next time. And we will, uh, next time we will be doing, um, I never can remember the name of it, but let me look it up for you. Uh, Mahasachika Sutta, the Mahasachika Sutta. Okay. Yeah. Um, you. Um, can, I, um, can I ask you to, to if the book can take me four page um, in the computer to make it the first sound? We don't have any sound. I'm able to hear. Can, can I ask you if it's possible to get the four page medical thing you did on a, an Athapindika's uh, sutta? Yeah, I can do that for you. I was going to send that to Perel also. And um, wait a second. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Okay. All right, let's come together for our prayer. Gunti. May suffering ones be suffering. May the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired. For the acquisition of all kinds of happiness, may beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.